So the secret to victory, because I'm tired of losing, and I think you're tired of losing too, but I can guarantee you victory after victory after victory, and that's going to happen through Mary. That's going to happen through Mary. So we have to have our Marian theology straight first. Why Mary? Why do we have to have Mary? Why should I go through Mary? Why should I give my life to Mary? Because we've been kind of scared into thinking, oh, we don't want to focus too much on Mary because that will take away from Jesus. We have to be thoroughly convinced that nobody can love Mary more than our Lord did. Our Lord is the second person of the Holy Trinity who's infinite, who loves Mary infinitely more than we could possibly conceive of. We have no need to worry about loving Our Lady too much. It's a joke to think that that's even possible. Is it possible for me to love Our Lady more than St. Joseph? Inconceivable inconceivable. Is it possible for me to love Our Lady more than John the Beloved who took her into his home? Inconceivable. Why do we give ourselves to Mary? First and foremost, what is your role? What is the goal? Why did Jesus come? So that he could be united to you, so that he could be one with you. God loves you so much that he gives himself to you in the most holy Eucharist so the two may become one flesh. The goal of the Christian life Christian perfection is this, union with God. Heaven is this, union with God. And so too, when you want to become like Christ, the very first step is to say, Mary, be my mother. Mary, I will do your will. Why? Because Jesus did your will. If God the Father found that the will of Our Lady was perfect for her son, it's perfect and it's good enough for me. So we have to remember, it is God's will that you have a mother. And it's scriptural too. If we were to look at scripture with eyes that have not been tainted by fear of idolatry, we would see the scriptures very clear. From the beginning, there was a man and a woman. And the woman, Eve, took the fruit that God had forbidden and she gave it to Adam. And then God said to the serpent who deceived her, I will put enmity between you and the woman. And this is very important. Between your offspring and hers. Our Lady has offspring. This has been proclaimed from the beginning. If we look at the most important times in the life of Jesus Christ, anytime Our Lady is present, it's always at the most important moments in the life of Jesus Christ. Of course, at the Annunciation. Of course, at the Wedding Feast of Cana. The Wedding Feast of Cana is miles deep, even though it's only a few short verses. Miles deep. And then at the foot of the cross. At the foot of the cross, we have Adam and Eve all over again at the tree. The first Eve, at the tree of knowledge of good and evil, took the fruit down from the tree. She brought death into the world. Now Mary, the new Eve, the woman, is at the tree of life. And she's putting the fruit of her womb back onto the tree. Speaking of the wedding feast of Cana, a lot of times people think that Jesus is being rude or ugly because he calls his mother woman. That is a reference to the garden where Adam called the old Eve woman. And now Jesus, the new Adam, is calling Mary the new Eve woman. And instead of tempting Jesus to do a sin like Eve did to Adam, Our Lady is tempting Jesus to do the first miracle. Just as the old Eve believed a demon, a bad angel, the new Eve believes the good angel and brings grace and life. At the foot of the cross, Jesus, the last thing he does, he says, woman, oh, wow, I got louder. This is very important words. You better listen. They got louder. He said, woman, behold your son. And to the disciple whom he loved, very important, was John bragging. Throughout all of history, everybody will know Jesus loved me the most. Sorry, Peter, you're the first, but I am the one whom Jesus loved. Everybody will know for the next 2,000 years of Christianity. That's not why he did it. He was trying to give a pattern of discipleship. The disciple whom Jesus loves is the one to whom he says, behold your mother. And from that day forward, John took her into his home as his very own mother. And the words immediately after say, and Jesus knowing that all things had been completed. That was it. The purpose of Jesus' life was to make it possible for you to be united with him in the Eucharist, for you to have your sins forgiven so that you can be united to him in the Eucharist, so that you could be united with him in heaven. And the last step 
was to give you a mother, a mother. If Our Lady gives birth to the body of Christ and Christ is the head, she gives birth to the members of the body of Christ. And then finally, John, who plays 40 chess. Remember, John was the, the greatest of all of the gospels. He's always shown wearing eagle's wings. There's an eagle in all of the imagery of St. John because he was so full of the Holy Spirit because he lived with the spouse of the Holy Spirit. So he's always playing 4D chess. He's always using words like woman. So he wrote the book of Revelation and in Revelation chapter 12, everybody knows that there was an ark and then all of a sudden they go to describe the woman and the woman was clothed with the sun and she had the moon under her feet and she had a crown of 12 stars and then we kind of stopped thinking about it. But what happens after that is that there was a great war in heaven and there was a war between a dragon and the woman. John says the dragon is going after her offspring. And John is very clear to make it clear to you and me that we are that offspring because he says the offspring of Our Lady are those who believe in Jesus Christ and are trying to live the commandments. Is it true that Mary is your mother? Yes. Do we believe it? Do we believe it? Have we thought about what a mother is? If your mothers have had small children and you see them nursing the baby, constantly putting the baby at her breast, feeding the baby, when the baby cries, mother comes. When the kid sprains the ankle, mother comes. When the child is filthy, mother comes. When the child is hungry, mother comes. Our Lady loves with the love of a million mothers. If you could put the love of a million mothers in one woman at the crib of a child, she would never leave. She would never leave. She would always watch you. Do you believe that at the name of Mary, she'll come to you? You don't even have to have a prayer. A mother knows when a child's saying, Mom, they know the difference between Mom and Mom. A mother knows the difference. She knows the difference when her child is hungry. She knows the difference when her child is scared. She knows the difference when her child is in danger. She loves you. And all you have to say is mom. Our lady is present. If Jesus loves us so much that he gives us the real presence, that he'll sit in the tabernacle waiting for us just to come for 30 minutes or one hour a week, waiting just to receive you in Holy Communion and you receive him. If he loves you so much for that, to give you his real presence there, is it not also conceivable that he gives you his very own mother to be with you at every moment. Is that possible? That's the reality. If she's the perfect mother of Jesus Christ, her love for you is so intimate, it's so present, it's always present. Our Lady is with you, always. You only have to call upon her name. She never forgets us, we forget her. We don't realize the power that we have. God has won the victory for us. Our Lady is the mediatrix of all grace. Quick theology lesson. Grace is a gift from God for salvation. That salvation is in human form, Jesus Christ. So Mary, who brings us Jesus Christ, we call her the mediatrix because she brings Jesus Christ into our life. What does that mean? Because that, that's what we believe, that Mary is the mediatrix of all, capital A, capital L, capital L. Every gift that you receive, every sacrament that you receive, every favor obtained from God, according to Thomas Aquinas, the angelic doctor, comes through Our Lady. Could God the Father do it another way? He could have but he chose to come through Mary. St. Bernardine of Siena says, Our Lady gives what she wills, as much as she wills, as often as she wills, however she wills, to whom, whoever she wills, because she's the treasurer of grace, and she's also the treasury. And so what does that mean? So in theology, in reality, we live in the present moment. So we receive actual grace, grace that God gives us to do his will to do your calling in life, to make the right choice, to withstand temptation, to make an act of charity, to love your neighbor, to love somebody who's harmed you. You only receive that grace now. Earlier when we were in adoration, that doesn't exist anymore. Five years ago when somebody cut you off or something horrible happened in your past that you think about a lot, that doesn't exist. It only exists in here. The future that we're worried about, the tests we have tomorrow, the conflict that's coming up this weekend, that does not exist. It only exists in here. God gives you grace right here, right now, 
to do his will. And by worrying about the future and by dwelling upon the past is an insult to his divine providence and to his divine mercy. St. Therese of Lisieux would say, I only have peace because I do everything in my power to focus on the present moment, to leave my past to God's mercy and my future to God's providence. Because God's giving you actual grace right now. Why do I bring this up? Because Our Lady is the mediatrix of that grace. Our Lady is the one who's watching you at every single second, dispensing with your grace specifically, individually. Her love for you, her gaze for you, is with a, a mother whose heart is on fire and who has all the power of God because God wills it. Because God wills it. Why did St. Alphonsus say that Our Lady is omnipotent by grace? Because Jesus is a good son. Our Lady being his mother, he has to obey her. He lived in her house for 30 years under her obedience. The voice of Mary to Jesus was the will of God for Jesus, was the voice of God the Father. That's why we know St. Joseph is also great. So if Our Lady has that power to say, son, they have no more wine. Woman, what business is this of mine? Do whatever he tells you. And he does it. This is not my hour. Do whatever he tells you. He's going to do it. Just like when a child says to his mom, but mom, I have to do my homework. Go wash the dishes. No arguing, no, nothing. Just do it. We also have to remember that Our Lady is a queen. She's a queen. Your mother has the intimacy and the fire of the love of a thousand million gajillion mothers. And she's also the queen. This is scriptural. Jesus is a king from the line of King David. In the Old Testament, King David had at least eight wives. Solomon had hundreds of wives. So the mother was the queen, and the role of the queen was to intercede for the common people. Your mother is the queen because Jesus is a king from the line of King David. Jesus, God the Father, the Son of the Holy Spirit, crowned Our Lady as queen of apostles, queen of martyrs, queen of virgins, queen of confessors, queen of angels. She's higher than all of the angels. Most importantly, Our Lady is the spouse of the Holy Spirit. And now we're going to get a little mystical, my brothers and sisters, because she loves her son more than anybody else, and he died for you to go to heaven. So her number one interest is your sanctification. St. Maximilian Kolbe says that nobody becomes a saint without Our Lady. And the quickest path to sanctity is the Virgin Mary, whose job it is to form other people into Christ because she's the spouse of the Holy Spirit. When you give your life to Mary, a lot of things happen. The first thing that she does is she puts you in her womb. The role of the Holy Spirit, remember God is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. The role of the Holy Spirit is to form Christ in the womb of Our Lady. When you give yourself to Mary, the Holy Spirit forms you into Christ in the womb of the Virgin Mary. Why do we give ourselves to Our Lady? Because Jesus did it first. What is holiness? Union with God. I give myself to Mary, the Holy Spirit, whose role it is to make Christ in the womb of Our Lady, makes me into Christ. It becomes her priority just by saying, Fiat, let it be done to me according to thy word, blessed mother. You want to be my mom? You want to make me a saint? I give you permission. It's not forced. It's the first step is surrender. I give you permission. She's the spouse of the Holy Spirit. Maximilian Kolbe says, she is so perfectly united, and you're going to have to pay attention to me because this is going to get hard, but it's, it's important. It's important for you to understand the rosary. I'm trying to get there. Maximilian Kolbe says that Our Lady is the quasi-incarnation of the Holy Spirit. The union between Our Lady and the Holy Spirit is so perfect that it, it's like the Holy Spirit took on flesh. He didn't, but it's like it. He had this theology. He gave a conference in Rome. They didn't have what we have now where you can record and say, oh, look, this is what Maximilian Kobe said. Let us watch. But all of the friars were taking vicious notes when he was speaking because he had the odor of sanctity. And I'll, I'll explain why in a second. You can't see it, but he wrote on the chalkboard, capital V, write this on your paper if you have it. Write this on your heart if you don't have paper. Capital V plus lowercase v equals S. Brilliant man. Brilliant people give you easy math equations and make them deep. Capital V, he said, is Latin for voluntas, which is will. Capital V plus lowercase v. The will of God united to my will. So we'll just call it W. W plus W equals S, sanctity. Capital W the cross is sacrifice of my will for God's will. United to my little will equals sanctity. So Our Lady, because she's big brain, big heart, she's united her will perfectly to God. 
and that equals sanctity. When we say Our Lady is a spouse, what is a spouse? When a man gives himself to a woman, he says the words, I give myself to you fully, freely, totally, faithfully, fruitfully, all the words of theology of the body that basically mean this, I give you everything. You say those words, and only after you make the action, you make the act of the will with the body, is the marriage consummated and made indissoluble. So to Our Lady, the two became one flesh, and Jesus was born. She gave birth to Christ because of her intimate union with God. Very important, very important, because this is where you start to come into play. We say the church was born at Pentecost by the power of the Holy Spirit. If Mary is the mother of the church, she gave birth to the church. She taught the apostles how to pray to receive the fullness of the Holy Spirit so that they could become like Christ. They spent a nine-day retreat inside the womb of Our Lady, so to speak, and she gave birth to them by the power of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit overshadowed her. The same language that's used at Pentecost is used at the Annunciation, and this is where it becomes very, very important. Maximilian Kolbe, St. Louis de Montfort, John Paul II, all of the saints. St. Bernard said, I don't know of, and he's a doctor of the church, I don't know of any saint who is a saint who did not have an extraordinary devotion to Our Lady. And so the words we now use is total consecration. Total consecration. I give myself to you, Mary, totally. I give you my merits. I give you my time. I give you my future. I give you my money. I give you my family. I give you everything. Most importantly, what did Maximilian Colby say was sanctity? I give you my will. It's very easy for me to say, Mary, you're my banker. Take my merits. I know you're going to bring good out of it because you're the best banker. When I give you my will, that means I die. Who gave Mary their will first? Again, this is the essence of sanctity. Who gave Mary their will first? Jesus Christ. He submitted his will totally to Mary. Why should I give my will totally to Mary? Because Jesus did it first. And what happens? So this is what you have to understand. It is God's will for the church. It is God's will for every soul to give their life to the Virgin Mary. She is the fashioner of saints. All the 12 apostles are dead giveaways on the power of this. They ran like little cowards when Jesus was starting to go up the way of the cross. Only one made it to the foot of the cross. The one that was totus tuus Maria from the beginning. The one whom Jesus loved. The beloved disciple that's called to be you. So it is God's will that you give your life to Mary. It is God's will and all the saints, St. Louis de Montfort has coined this phrase, but many of the saints used it. She is the fastest, quickest, best, most efficacious, most holy, most secure path to Jesus Christ. All the saints say it. It's God's will that you unite yourself to her will. Her will is God's will, but in a sweeter way. You will get the cross either way, but when you give your life to Mary, she dips the cross in sweetness. Like a mother, when the father says, you're grounded, you can only have ham for dinner. You did not eat my dinner. Uh. And the mother says, yeah, here, take these grapes. You can have them. Don't tell your dad. That's what Our Lady does. You still have the cross. She cleans you. What does a mother do? She cleans you when you're filthy. When we sin, where do we go? We go to confession. Those who are devoted to Our Lady will go to confession more frequently. It's always the case. You see the people going in line, a lot of them, they have the rosary, even if they didn't pray it when they're in temptation. She makes sure you eat the Eucharist. She consoles you when you're crying. The devil is called the one who brings desolation. In the theology of Ignatius of Loyola, the devil brings desolation. I'm, I'm telling you all of this because I want something from you. I want something from you. And I just need one of you to do this. The church always says, and people in the church always say things like, all it took was 12 apostles to convert the world. And I'm like, great. We don't have 12 apostles. All I need is one Mary. All I need is one Mary to bring Christ into the world. I came here to convert Baylor. And all I need is one of you. Why? One of the other signs of Our Lady is the Ark of the Covenant. In the Old Testament, 
The Ark of the Covenant was built with the purest pristine gold. Oh, it was so precious. Why? Because it had the power and the presence of God over it. It had the word of God in stone, the Ten Commandments. It had the rod of Aaron, the high priest. It had the bread that came down from heaven, the manna in the desert. Our Lady is the Ark of the New Covenant. She had the word of God made flesh. She has the eternal priest, not some rod. She has the bread of eternal life inside of her. Just like the power of God overshadowed the ark, the power of God overshadows Mary, the new ark. But in the Old Testament, when the Israelites would take the ark into battle, they would win. In the Old Testament, when they took the ark around Jericho, the walls came crashing down. In the Old Testament, there was nobody around the ark. The ark was stolen. And they put the ark in a pagan temple. And there was pagan idols in there. They came back the next morning. The pagan idols were crashed down. Why do I come here? Because I want you to become Mary. That's the plot twist. I gave you miraculous medals so that you can take an image of Our Lady everywhere you go. Because, yeah, ideally we'd process Mary all around with a giant image of Our Lady of Fatima praying the rosary. They ain't going to let that happen. But we can sneak her in around our neck. But more importantly than bringing an image of Our Lady, you need to become Mary. How? The will. All you have to do, and Maximilian Kolbe was an absolute insane madman. He said you must be transubstantiated into Mary. Pope John Paul II, he said he's the prophet of the new millennium. This is for you. You stay the same on the outside. Trevor stays the same. He looks like the same guy. John looks like the same guy. Mary looks like the same girl. Transubstantiation is a change in substance, not in form. When you do the will of Our Lady, it is no longer I who live, but Mary who lives in me. When, when you, and how do I do it? Mary, what should I do? First of all, if it's go to class, it's go to class. Just say, Mary, how, what should I do? It's time to go to class. I'm going to class with Mary. Mary is present. I'm doing Mary's will. Mary, when she visited her cousin Elizabeth, is the perfect example of what's going to happen to you if you do Mary's will. St. Teresa of Avila had said, there's no Jesus in the world, so you have to be the hands and feet of Jesus. I am telling you, there's no Mary in the world. You have to be the hands and the feet of Mary. Our Lady just greeted Elizabeth. And it says very clearly, the moment your greeting reached my ears. I was filled with the Holy Spirit. The child leapt in my womb. She sanctified a baby just by saying hello because she was doing the will of God. You have that power. When you receive Holy Communion, you're more powerful than the Ark of the Old Covenant. When you go into people's lives and you do Mary's will, not your will, that's the difference. You must die. You must say, what is your will, Blessed Mother? My will for you is to reconcile with your estranged friend that you've not talked to in a long time. And you go and say, I'm sorry. And their heart is changed. And you, what do you do? You bring Christ there. You cast demons out. So recap, how are you going to change the world? How are you going to go from victory to victory? Be united to her who is victory itself. You just have to remember that victory in Christ looks like Jesus on the cross and not like money and power and fame. It's impossible to do the will of God without grace. It's impossible. You can't do it. This device right here is how you die and Mary lives. This is boring. It's boring. Anybody who tells you otherwise is going through extraordinary consolation and they will be in despair soon. <laughs> Where did we get this? St. Dominic was a great preacher. He was a better preacher than Bishop Barron times Fulton Sheen times the best preachers you've ever heard. He was the best. He was the best. He was God's dog. He was bark wherever the Lord sent him. But he was ineffective at preaching against heresy. He was a failure in his own heart. Even though he had natural gifts, even charismatic gifts, he was not converting the Albigensians. And so he offered himself to Our Lady as a victim soul. He said, Blessed Mother, I'm not going to eat. I'm not going to sleep. I'm going to do the worst, hardest, most extreme penances that will get a normal person today. They'll put it, you've been in a mental hospital for anything. And he fainted after three days of these extraordinary penances. And afterwards, Our Lady appeared to him and said to him, Dominic, with you I am well pleased. 
You've had great confidence in me, and now I'm going to give you the answer that you sought. Now, I have to make this very clear. That's why we went into this other realm, this previous information, so that you can understand how powerful this is. If this came from Our Lady, everything about it is perfect. And this, these were her words. She said, preach my Psalter. Preach my Psalter. In this type of warfare, the answer has been and always will be the angelic salutation. I have to break that down for you. Preach my Psalter. What does that mean? In the olden days, the commoners could not read. So instead of praying the Psalms like the religious would do, the common man would pray 150 Hail Marys, the Marian Psalter. They had other forms of Psalter. But Our Lady revealed to preach the Psalter tied to the mysteries of the life of Jesus Christ. The angelic salutation is the battering ram. Very important. We're going to come back to this. Everything about this is perfect. The fact that it is boring, my brothers and sisters, is exactly why we need to do it. When I pray this, I die every single time. Every time I pick this up, I die. My will dies. I want to watch the news. I want to play video games. I want to look at my phone. I want to check this. I want to check that. And when I do this, I die to myself. It is no longer I who lives, but our lady who lives in me. This is the physical manifestation of the Virgin Mary. I look at it and I see a lot of Hail Mary beads. We look at the eyes of the face of the Virgin Mary. We see Mary, but inside our lady is the spirit of God. Similarly, inside this rosary, when you get into the mysteries, it is the spirit of God. The purpose of this, our lady's a warrior. She's your mother, but she's a warrior. And this is to train you for battle, battle against temptations of the flesh. St. Alphonsus Liguori said that Our Lady is synonymous with purity. Any man who calls upon Our Lady, he's more pure than he was the moment before. You're going to battle with impurity for the rest of your life, folks. If you're struggling with impurity now, it's not going to leave you until 10 minutes after you're dead. But St. Alphonsus Liguori says, if you're tempted to sin, call upon Our Lady. And don't stop calling upon Our Lady. And when you come to the confessional and you're truly not sure, remember Dr. Moore theology, you're not sure whether you committed the sin of lust or not, because you were fighting. The first thing I'm going to ask you, did you call upon Our Lady? Yes. Did you stop calling upon Our Lady? No. Then you did not sin. And if you did sin because you stopped calling upon Our Lady and your soul is dead, you call upon Our Lady and you won't be dead for very long. Impurity and Our Lady do not coexist. When we have the presence of Mary, imagine you're alone in your room, struggling with solitary sin. The temptation will come. The, the devil is there. You're alone, but you're not alone because you're always talking to Our Lady. You have a sense that your mother's present. You're not going to say, hey, get away from your mother. I'm going to look at the computer in bad pictures. No, because Our Lady's there with you. You would not do these horrible things in front of your mother, let alone the mother who has the grace and the assistance to help you. When we have a sense of Our Lady, not only do we act better and we sin less, we act more virtuously. Because when we're aware that she's present, she's looking at us and she makes us feel guilty. All right, so what does this do? This turns you into Mary. This brings the sense of the presence of Our Lady. The Holy Spirit will speak to you through it. The Holy Spirit will speak to you through it. If this is from Mary, this is the key that unlocks all the doors. Everything is better when you do this. I give you my word. I will die and burn in hell for all of eternity if this is not true. Everything is better when you do this. Every sacrament received is elevated. Every relationship you have is elevated. Every natural activity. If you play basketball and you're good, you pray the rosary, you'll be better. Why? Thomas Aquinas says grace perfects nature. Everything, everything is better. I give you my word. On a natural level, you're good. On a supernatural level, with the assistance of the rosary, you'll be extraordinary. It's extraordinary. Why? What's in this that makes it so powerful? First, it's boring. Our culture is, let me look, let me look, give me my food now. I want this now, 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 now. This says, stop, put that down. You need this. This is a, a weapon of training. If you're lifting weights, you got to keep lifting. This is what this is. These are your spiritual weights. What else is in this? Vocal prayer. It's got all the prayers in here. 
Vocal prayer is what? The words I say, our Father and Hail Mary. It's got the best ingredients, superfood. The our Father, Jesus' words. Lord, teach us how to pray. Say, our Father who art in heaven. Perfect prayer. What else? What did Mary say? The angelic salutation, the Hail Mary. We pray it 50 times. Why? This is transforming me into Mary. You give your life to Mary because of Jesus, and then you become Mary for Jesus because she's the perfect disciple, the perfect apostle. What did Our Lady do her entire life? It's in Scripture several times. She pondered this. She pondered this. She pondered this. What did she ponder the most? The moment that everything changed. The Hail Mary. All of creation was waiting for those sacred words. Hail Mary, full of grace. God the Father was waiting for those words since the moment Adam and Eve fell in the garden. Every good angel in heaven was waiting for those words. All the patriarchs, the prophets, and every Jew who died before was waiting to hear those words, Hail Mary, full of grace. Every night Our Lady was thinking of that most intimate moment, the moment that God became flesh inside of her. And she pondered that mystery with every other aspect of the life of Jesus Christ. And the life of Jesus Christ is also an ingredient in this mystery. I gave everybody a packet of the rosary, not because you don't have a rosary, but because you most likely don't have a packet. Why? Because you can see the life of Jesus Christ all day. There's a principle in theology. A grace remembered is a grace renewed. If I were to think about Pentecost every day, like the Pentecostals, I'd start to work Pentecostal miracles because I'm thinking about the power of the Holy Spirit daily. That's all they pray with. If I think about the passion of Jesus Christ regularly, I'm going to have a hatred and a horror for sin. If I think about the wedding feast of Cana regularly, I'm going to have a greater respect for the dignity of marriage. If I think about the institution of the Eucharist daily, I'm going to think about the power of the Most Holy Eucharist every day. A grace remembered is a grace renewed. Our Lady is training you to become a saint. You're thinking about these sacred mysteries every day. Wow, the power, the fruit is undeniable. I don't care how sinful you are. I don't care what you've done. I don't care how horrible of a person you are naturally. I'm a wretched person. I prayed for four hours today saying, God, save me from myself. Help me only to talk about you, and I'm already messing it up right now. Okay, but God can change anybody through the power of the Most Holy Rosary. Anybody. I've seen it. I've had high schoolers who are smoking marijuana from the seventh grade. They start praying the entire rosary every day. Now they're going to the seminary. I've had friends who are doing hardcore drugs every weekend, committing sins of lust every single day with strangers, with themselves, with anybody who is willing. And now they're as pure as angels by the power of the Most Holy Rosary. Why? Because it would be an insult to God. It would be an insult to the Father who loves Our Lady more than anybody. It would be an insult to the Holy Spirit. It would be an insult to Jesus if their mother did not rescue those who called upon her. St. Alphonsus Liguori, Doctor of Moral Theology, said, No child of Mary shall ever be lost. Never. No matter what, if they've given their life to the Virgin Mary, they're praying the rosary, they're not going to hell. Inconceivable. Inconceivable. Now, every recent Marian apparition, Lourdes, Our Lady appeared, she had the rosary on her arm every single time. St. Bernadette would start praying the rosary in the grotto in Lourdes, and only after she started to pray the rosary would Our Lady appear. She'd become visibly present. There was thousands of people by the time St. Bernadette left, and our Lady was present, although they did not see her. When you pray this, the demon flees. At Lourdes, the demons were coming for Bernadette. She said it sounded like the roar of a million horrible animals coming down the river. And Our Lady just went like this. And the demons turned around and fled at the mere glance of the Virgin Mary. When you pray this, I don't care what desolation you're in. I don't care what temptation you have. I don't care what the circumstance is. Our Lady's going to be there and she's going to bring peace and she's going to bring consolation and she's going to bring purity every time. It tastes like chewing sand. It feels like I'm literally eating dirt. But by the time I'm done, I'm different. My circumstance might not be different, but my fear, my anxiety, it's gone now. Every time, it never fails. Now, if you look at the back of your picture, we're almost done. Don't worry, folks. First of all, look at the front picture. You see that heart on fire? 
that's your heart that she's holding in her hand. It's her heart, but if you give your life to her, it's your heart. Your heart's gonna be like, everywhere you go, you're gonna be setting people on fire. All you need is two things, remember. Recall that Mary's present, ask her, what do you want me to do? And then do it. Because now you're walking in the path of Our Lady, you're transubstantiated, so to speak. You're letting Our Lady live and act and work through you. Okay. Now, the 15 promises of those who pray the rosary, because every good mother knows you got to bribe your kids sometimes. Like a good mother, Our Lady is the best of them. All right, so she gives 15 promises. I'm not going to go through all of them. I'm just going to go through a couple. Number one, whoever shall faithfully serve me by the recitation of the rosary shall receive signal graces. Our Lady will give you little signs because when you're discerning something, you don't just go off signs. And you don't just go off your feelings. There's a process of discernment that has to happen, especially in major life choices. And you never make a decision when you're in desolation. So your spiritual director will say, what are you getting in times of consolation? Remember, who's the consoler? The Holy Spirit. Who's the one who brings desolation? The devil. Who's Our Lady? The one who crushes the head of the serpent, the spouse of the Holy Spirit. So Our Lady will console your conscience to help you know what is her will and also you will receive little signs as a little pat on the back saying, my baby, I love you. You're doing so good. You're making the right choice. See, you'll normally get that sign after, sometimes before if you're really desperate and you're praying hard. Number two, I promise my special protection and the greatest graces to all of those who shall recite the Holy Rosary. Special protection. John Paul II prayed at least four rosaries a day on the Feast of Our Lady of Fatima, an apparition where she said, pray the rosary every day, pray the rosary every day, pray, she's like a broken record. Oh, they want healing, blessed mother. Tell them they must pray the rosary every day. It was like the same message. Also, if they don't, people are going to hell. So pray the rosary every day. That should be a consolation. People don't like to talk about Fatima because it's scary because she took children to hell. But she wasn't trying to scare them. She was trying to say, all you have to do to save souls is pray the rosary every day. It's a message of hope. Anyways, on the anniversary of the Feast of Our Lady of Fatima, May 13th, 1981, John Paul II was in St. Peter's Square. A gunman named Mehmet Aliaja released bullets into his chest. And although the bullets were perfectly square on, somehow... They moved in such a way, they missed every single vital organ, and he healed in record time. And afterwards they said, Holy Father, you weren't even worried. You weren't even like uh, anxious. You didn't have death anxiety. So when you're about to die, it's natural to have death anxiety, unless it's a supernatural grace that you have a happy and holy death. You didn't have death anxiety. And he said, I knew I was going to live. And although one evil finger pulled the trigger intending an evil action, Our Lady was guiding the bullets with her finger. I knew it. From the moment it happened, I sensed the hand of providence. Number three, this is very, very important. The rosary shall be a powerful armor against hell. It will destroy vice. What is a vice? A sin is an evil action, a disordered action. Disordered naturally in the natural order, we call that sin because it is an offense against God's order. Chaos in Jewish. A vice is when you do that sin over and over and over again. Our Lady promises if you pray the rosary, it will destroy vice. She made these promises to St. Dominic and to Blessed Alan. It will destroy vice. There's so many people who are struggling with addictions to pornography, so many people who are addicted to weed, so many people addicted to sexual actions. Even, even when you're trying to be pure in relationships, it's hard. Even if you're like both well-intending, we're praying, we're doing these things. It, you, when you love somebody, your desire is to become one. It's hard to be chaste. And Our Lady promises, if you pray the rosary, it will destroy vice. Now I'm gonna break something to you. Y'all are not the norm. This is a little bubble. This is a little bubble. Most people are living in mortal sin. Do not get married to somebody who's not Catholic. Ladies, I'm looking especially at you because the temptation is there's nobody good out there. The goal of marriage is to get to heaven. If this person is living in mortal sin, they're not going to get themselves to heaven. They're not going to get you to heaven. A relationship is hard enough it's hard enough when you believe everything and you're working together. When your most core values are not the same, you're going to have struggle after struggle. When you're taking the kids to church and dad is at home, those, not only are you not getting him to heaven, the kids aren't going to heaven. 
Why? Because statistics show us very clearly the spiritual role of the father is of the utmost importance. When dad isn't practicing the faith, I don't care if your mother is Saint Rita or whoever the saint of mothers is, those kids are only 5% chance of keeping the faith. When the father is engaged, the father is a spiritual leader, it doesn't matter if the wife is a prostitute floozy on the weekend, the kids will be 95% chance keeping the faith because of the spiritual role of the Father. And the reality is, we're broken. I, I, I mean this from the bottom of my heart. So what are you gonna do? There's nobody to marry except the guys here. There's nobody for the guys to marry except the women here. What are you gonna do? I'll tell you what you're gonna do. Because you can meet a guy, you'll meet a nice Christian guy, this Baptist over here, and they'll say, I'm pure. I, I, I don't look at pornography. <laughs> In a time where it requires heroic virtue to be pure, you're telling me you're pure? I can't trust you. I wouldn't trust you. Nobody's going to say, yeah, I look at pornography five times a day. Nobody's going to say that. They're going to lie. How can you be sure that they're pure? You pray with them. You pray the rosary with them. And you see it every single day. And then I can assure you, when you don't see them, they're being pure. Why? Because mortal sin and Our Lady do not coexist. They do not coexist. This is your only hope for a happy marriage. This is the only hope for your children to be holy. They might resent it. When you're, I'm telling you this now because I don't know if you're ever going to hear it again. They might resent it, making your children pray the rosary day in and day out. But I work with high school teens and although they resent it, and you resented it too if you did it with your family, they're the only ones who keep the faith. Why? Because they're saying, Blessed Mother, pray for me now and at the hour of my death. And if you say that 50 times a day as a family, and you say that 365 days a year, and you say that for 15 years from the age of reason, they've said the pray for me now and at the hour of my death thousands of times. That means they're a child of Mary, and they're not going to hell whether they like it or not. Because no child of Mary will ever be lost. Now, I'm not going to read to you. You can read the rest of these, and I hope you meditate upon them. Some of you who pray the rosary will say, this sounds great. And then you think, wait, this doesn't happen for me. <laughs> My life is struggle. <laughs> My life is difficult. That's where I want to take you back to something St. Dominic said. Now, I want to be clear. If you don't pray any rosaries, only start with one but do it, and you have to have a plan. Don't be like, I'm going to pray the rosary before bed. I'm going to lay in my bed and pray the rosary. Our Father who art never... <sighs> I don't care if you're insomniac. You never sleep. You only sleep one hour a night. I don't care what your illness is. Never was it known that anybody who laid down with the rosary did not fall asleep. <laughs> the devil himself will be stroking your head. Hush, little baby, don't say a word. Okay? Be laying down is not the time to pray. If you're going to pray at night, you get on your knees or you sit up straight in a firm chair, okay? All right. But if you're not praying any rosary, do one. If you're praying the rosary, I need soldiers. Our Lady needs soldiers. What did Our Lady say to St. Dominic? She said, preach my psalter. Preach my psalter. And when St. Dominic did, Conversion everywhere he went. Lives changed. Miracles everywhere he went. Grave sinners, even little children, seven years old, eight years old, totally converted on fire out of love for God. My Psalter. What is the Psalter? 150. 150. If you want firepower, if you already know that you're trash like me and you want to not be trash, try, strive to do more. The spiritual life is a battle. If you pray one rosary day, that's great. Start there, okay? Do it. It's not a sin not to pray the rosary. I want to be very clear. You're not committing a sin when you don't pray the rosary. But my little buddy, St. Alphonsus Liguori, Dr. Moral Theology said, if I did not pray at least one rosary every day, I would fear for my salvation because of the things that I would commit without the assistance of Our Lady. Strive, my brothers and sisters, strive. Because when you try to do two or three and you fail, you did one. I got one in. I failed at three. I got one in. When you fail at one, you got zero. Not good odds. 
If you've ever been in a situation where on a regular basis you have a temptation that is extraordinary, that you feel like you have no willpower, this is an analogy, but like you're trying to drive the wheel and then it feels like an, an extraordinary force is grabbing the wheel and pulling it very hard in a certain direction to the point where you almost feel like you don't have free will, but you do at the very last minute and you fall. That could be something called a diabolical obsession. You're not possessed. No need to bother the priest. You just need to live a life of extraordinary holiness. You only bother him to go to confession. So what do you do? If you pray a rosary in the morning, Our Lady crushes the head of the serpent in the morning. And then you pray a rosary at lunch, Our Lady crushes the head of the serpent at lunch. And then you pray a rosary before bed, Our Lady crushes the head of the serpent before bed. And you will notice that peace is the norm. Stability is the norm. Power is the norm. Hearing the voice of God is the norm. Desolation is going to be an extremely rare, rare case. And because the devil is Mary's monkey, if you've prayed your rosary and something bad has happened, even if it was diabolical, you could say, I know for a fact that Our Lady's in control and that bad thing Our Lady only allowed to happen because she was going to bring about a greater good. You get in a car accident while you're praying the rosary, you can sit back and say, okay, Mary, what do you got planned here? I'll sit back. I'll go with this. You got something planned. Something good's going to happen. I know it. Now, that doesn't mean your life is going to be easy. Let me be very clear. Our Lady is a good mother, and good mothers have disciplined children, and disciplined children only are disciplined because they've been disciplined. So Our Lady is going to allow a little uh, slap in the back of the head or a little tugging of the ear because she wants you to be disciplined. But a lot of that discipline will occur through praying the Most Holy Rosary. Now, I'm going to give you tips on how to pray the rosary, and then we'll wrap up. So tip number one, brothers and sisters, if you're making a resolution, and I need you to make this resolution, the, the war is going badly because we have nobody fighting. I need everybody here to take up their weapon. The first step in praying the rosary, you got to carry the weapon with you everywhere you go. Everywhere you go, you, you're not going to pray the rosary if you do not have a rosary with you. I'm going to pray the rosary today. I don't have a rosary. Not going to happen. You'll start on your fingers and you'll be done. Like day two, you're, never, you're not praying anymore because your fingers are first and foremost fingers, not beads. I personally open carry. This is my weapon. I open carry everywhere I go. And the people are afraid of me. They say, watch out. He's a radical. He's a religious extremist. Yes, I am. <laughs> but I'm very friendly. <laughs> Step number two, have an intention. You're willing to do any what if you have a why. What is it that you love? Who is it that you love? That when you're not willing to do it, you'll say, oh, I'm going to do this because I don't want my dad to go to hell. Pick an intention for nine days. If you've never prayed the rosary before and you're going to pray only one rosary a day, say for the next nine days, I'm praying this rosary for my mom. I'm praying this rosary for my sister who smokes weed every day. Nine days. Why? Because that will form a habit. And also it's a novena. If you're praying one and you're trying to do two or three or four, nine days, set a goal or else you're going to quit. You need to build the habit. And I can assure you of one thing. Peace is going to come. Peace, consolation, security. It's all going to come. Nine days. Tip number one, carry a rosary. Tip number two, have an intention. Tip number three, are you ready for the secret? Everybody wants to know. I want to know how to pray the rosary so it's easier. It's so hard. I'm going to give you the tip. Are you ready? People pay big money for this tip. Just do it. It's never going to be easy. Get the words out. You're going to be going through desolation. Get the words out. Those words are like a club. The devil's the one who's whispering ideas into your mind. He's not a monster. The devil's a whisperer. He's going to whisper to you things that are like a string, like on a sweater. If he pulls that string, the whole thing's going to unravel. That's called desolation. Get the words out. You're going to be so depressed some days. Your mom's going to die. Your dad's going to die. Somebody in your family's going to get deathly ill. You're going to be crippled in depression some days. Get the words out. The words themselves, because they are sacred scripture, are going to get rid of the cloud. Ignatius of Loyola says, when you're in desolation, 
The only way out is to think of the time of consolation and to do acts of piety to cause down the mercy of God. And the sweetest mercy of God is Our Lady. Do it the best you can. Don't let your desire to be perfect keep you from doing something good. Just get it done. Next tip. If you're praying multiple rosaries a day, only pray the Apostles' Creed one time. So remember, this was intended to be one long prayer. A lot of times Catholics will add on a lot of extra prayers at the, every decade. They're like, and now to St. Joseph, and we can't forget John the Baptist. Okay, now we also have to have the Holy Spirit prayer. What makes the rosary powerful is the Our Father, the Hail Mary, meditation upon the life of Jesus Christ. A at the very least, do those. The Apostles' Creed in the beginning to start it off, very powerful. You don't have to do it for subsequent rosaries so that your, your rosary can be chronological. Number five is make a plan. You have to have a plan. If you're going to get anything done in life, you've got to have a plan. I'm going to pray the rosary on the way to school. I'm going to pray a rosary after my second class. If you're going to do multiple, I'm going to have two rosaries done before noon. I'll pray a rosary at dinner time. If you're praying four, I'll pray my last rosary with my friends walking around campus. You've got to have a plan. I encourage you, if you're going to just do two rosaries, do the same mystery twice. Why? Because I think it's important to do the luminous mysteries. There's trads out there who will say, those are invented by John Paul II. Those are from the devil because six, six, I don't know. They come up with so many crazy things. It's Illuminati because it's a luminous mysteries. I'm like, bro, that's a sin. No, bro, let me explain. The rosary is powerful because it's our Father in Hail Mary, meditation on the life of Christ. I personally believe that a canonization is infallible. And so therefore, St. John Paul II is literally a saint. He was a great mystic. I honestly believe that Our Lady revealed this to him. Why? Because what did I say earlier? A grace remembered is a grace renewed. What is the church severely crippled in today? Baptized unbelievers. So many people bring their children for baptism and they never come back to church. The first luminous mystery, the baptism of Jesus in the Jordan River. The second luminous mystery, the wedding feast of Cana. What is one of the worst problems in society? The breakdown of the family, a lack of respect for natural marriage, a lack of intercession of Our Lady where she intercedes at Cana. What else are we lacking in? Authentic teaching, mortal sin, hell, purgatory, heaven, indulgences, the saints, the virtues, doctors of the church. What is the third mystery? The proclamation of the kingdom. The fourth luminous mystery, the transfiguration. People say Jesus is just a philosopher. All religions are equal. He's just a guru. Let me break it down for you, ladies and gentlemen. Philosophers don't fly up in the sky, dazzling white, and then Moses and Elijah appear next to them. This was God revealing his divinity. What is the greatest tragedy? What is the sacred heart of Jesus? I gave you an image of the sacred heart. What, why is Jesus holding his heart with a crown of thorns around it? He revealed to St. Margaret Mary Alacoque that the heart is a gift of himself, which is the Eucharist, and he suffers now in the Eucharist more than he suffered in the Passion because of the indifference and the ingratitude and the sacrilege concerning the Most Holy Eucharist. There was a recent study, I'm sure you all heard of it, that out of the Catholics who go to Mass on Sunday, that's who attend Mass, not the thousands, the millions who left the church in the past 50 years. Of the Catholics who attend Mass on Sunday, only one-third believe in the Real Presence. What do we need to meditate upon? The institution of the Most Holy Eucharist. What do we need to meditate upon? The sacred priesthood. So I encourage you, don't leave out the luminous mysteries. If you only want to pray one or two or three, do the same mystery over and over again. If you want to do something for special intention or really level up, because you're like Mary, totus to us. My time is your time. I am a dead man. You want me to pray all the mysteries of the rosary every day as an act of my reparation for the sins of others? Go start in the morning with the joyful, then do the luminous, then do the sorrowful, then do the glorious at night. You have the entire life of Jesus Christ. You will go from victory to victory. Last two points that I'll make. In order to do this, we need profound humility. Why don't I pray? Because I don't think I need to. If you know your sins, you know what you're capable of. I know what I'm capable of. I'm capable of horrible, terrible things. There's a great saying from St. Philip Neri. Whenever we see somebody fall into a horrible vice, let's say somebody falls into child abuse, let's say somebody falls into uh, adultery or murder or road rage and they kill somebody, we should say, but for the grace of God, there go I. 
I'm not better than anybody else. And if I was born in their situation without the grace of God, that could be me. And the reality is God has chosen you. God has chosen you. God has chosen you. You have a choice to make. You have a choice to make. I can't make it for you. I can preach the rosary to you. I can say, pray the rosary every day. It's up to you whether you're going to surrender your life. You have not, what, what are you living for? There's, there's, not, there's nothing that great, to be honest with you. Say, totus tuus Maria. Not the easy way out, take my merits, take my money. No, take my will. Let me be a living Mary. Let Mary live in me so I can bring Christ into the world. Now, let me have my quotes. Where's my quotes? Thank you, madam. These are St. Maximilian Colby. This is what he says to you. He can't be here tonight. Sorry, guys, he's dead. But he's here in spirit. Imagine Maximilian Colby saying this to you. And then we'll conclude in prayer. Union with the Immaculate. To be an instrument in her immaculate hands. Here is the secret which guarantees success. You want to win. You want to be successful. Say, Mary, thy will be done. Fiat. She alone must instruct us. Each one of us. In every moment. She must lead us. Transform us into herself. Let us allow her to do with us and by means of us whatever she wants. And surely she will accomplish miracles of grace. We will become saints and great saints. And he's living proof. Let us conclude in prayer. Please kneel or stand. Whatever is better for you. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Blessed Mother, we thank you. We thank you for being here present with us. We thank you for helping us to hear these words. We beg of you, please, by the passion of Jesus Christ on the cross, by the passion he suffers in the most holy Eucharist, we beg of you, give us the grace to pray the rosary. Repeat after me, I surrender. I surrender. Blessed Mother, may your will be done. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen.